So you can see this full screen now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, I've been thinking about spinners for a few months now. Um, I've been trying to understand what they are. Uh, there's like four or five different ways of thinking about them. Um, and I'm hoping like today we'll get through like these first four sections. Um, and uh, I don't know, maybe we can do the rest another week. Uh, so I guess I'll just get started. And you can feel free to interrupt any time and ask questions. Um, OK, so uh, I guess the first thing that um, comes to mind when I think of spin is this stern gerlach experiment, which I think everyone has seen before. Um, basically, you have like a beam, beam of atoms that's put through a magnetic field. And like classically, we kind of expect a continuous distribution depending on like the atom's internal magnetic field alignment. But what actually happens is we only get two discrete um, spots, which sort of correspond to like the spin up state and the spin down state. <clears throat> um, and so basically, uh, when we're talking, uh, this first interpretation of a spinner is basically uh, like a state vector in quantum mechanics, where it's like uh, if this would be our spin up state and this would be the spin down state, then this spinner state would be like a superposition of those two, where alpha and beta are uh, complex numbers. Um, so I'm assuming everyone has sort of seen this before. This isn't too crazy or different. Yeah, I think I think we've all seen this before. Um, and then um, I think someone was questioning if I had this written correctly, but I think it's right. So uh, we have like you know these bra vectors and these ket vectors. Um, uh, bra vectors are sort of like functions on ket vectors that give you a scalar. And so this inner product here is the probab probability of uh, we have some state psi that we're in, and this is the probability of it collapsing onto state phi when we observe it. Uh, so can someone just confirm I'm not crazy there? Is that is that accurate? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah, okay, right. Okay, so um, now uh, if, if we're in this state psi, um, and again, this state phi is the state we want to get, then yeah, so this gives us, I, I think it's the squared, is this the squared probability or is it just the probability? I'm having a hard time remembering now. So you need to square it to get the probability. Okay, so you need to square, so this is not the squared probability. You need to square this to get the probability. Right, this is like the square root of the probability. Okay, yeah, sorry, I, I'm, a, I'm a bit rusty on my quantum there. And that's um, what I was saying so, in that message. Yeah, sorry, the, yeah, I got your message a bit too late there. Yeah, so, my bad. Um, so, uh, now, this uh, implies... So, that... Sorry, uh, Chris. Yeah. Uh, one, one question, is it the square root of the both of the probability of, uh, state and collapse in either state, or just the probability states, just to make sure? Sorry, could you repeat that? Oh, can you hear me well? Yeah, I can hear you well. Okay, so uh, the, when we take a square root, uh, are we taking it uh, from both probability state and the collapsing state, or just the probability state? Psi. Um, I I guess I don't quite understand your question. Like this no. gives like a. A scalar, I, I right? I understood it. So the thing is that you need both of them to express the probability of the first state to turn into the other. You, you cannot regard one side as having a probability. You could also think about it as a projection. You're, you're projecting psi onto phi. Okay, and then you take the square root. It's close. Oh, is um, it? It's, yeah, it's close. So you project psi onto phi, and that projection, if you square it, what it gives you is the probability of finding the state phi, given that you started in the state psi. 
okay, okay. So something like like that, I guess. Although we're dealing with complex numbers. Okay, okay. Now it's more clear. Thanks. Yeah, okay. It's a good question. Yeah, sorry. I, I I should have tried to pay more attention to detail, but like as you can see, I have like over a hundred slides and some stuff slipped by me. So I might need your help to correct me on some stuff. Um so yeah, so one of the consequences of this is that when we take the inner product of a state with itself, um, we need the probability to be one. Um, so this is sort of a rule in quantum mechanics where your states have to be normalized or else the probabilities you get don't make sense. And then another rule is if we can never get a state uh, chi from a state psi, then their inner product has to be zero. Um, so one example of that, I think I write it on a later slide, but if we have the up state and we want to see the probability of it collapsing on a down state, uh, that's impossible. So we just get a zero. So, so that's one example of, of uh, uh, basically this means that the states are like at right angles to each other. Um, so the inner product is going to be zero. Um, so I kind of wrote out the normalization explicitly here. So uh, if we have one equals the bra psi acting on the ket psi, um, basically this is just the linear combination that makes up psi, and then this is the bra version, and you'll notice that we have to take the complex conjugate of the probability amplitudes. Um, so this is like, you know, just use standard FOIL from high school, first, outer, inner, last, and we get four terms. Um, these are going to go to zero. Uh, because, again, it's impossible to get up from down or down from up. And then these go to 1, because, uh, as we said, probability normalization, uh, a state on itself just gives 1. And so this gives us uh, complex conjugate alpha times alpha plus complex conjugate beta times beta, which is just, um, you know, the magnitude of alpha squared plus the magnitude of beta squared gives 1. So this is sort of a constraint on the probability amplitudes for our spin system. OK. Um, now, another rule in quantum mechanics is that when we have a global phase factor, uh, so like a complex number with magnitude 1, it won't change any of the probabilities. Um, so we're doing this transformation on the ket where we uh, just put this complex phase in front. And when we do the bra on the ket, um, basically the bra gets the complex conjugate of this, which means we just change the i to a minus i. And then uh, the, the minus i theta and the plus i theta just cancel and we get one. So uh, basically we can always multiply a state by a complex phase factor and the probabilities won't change. So that's another quantum mechanics rule. Um, okay, so if we have this spinner, which is our two-state system, or like a superposition of our two-state up-down system, um, we can also sometimes write it as a column vector like this, where these are the probability amplitudes. Um, so basically, um, because of this uh, situation where we can uh, never get up from down, like they're orthogonal, uh, these two states in the state space uh, need to be like orthogonal or at 90 degrees. Um, I don't really know what the word for this is. I said like mutually exclusive. I don't know if that's the right word, but basically we can never get uh, up from down or, or we can never get down from up. Um, so because of this, we have this weird property where a spinner transforms to its negative when we rotate in physical space from zero to 360 degrees. Um, so in order to explain this, I tried drawing some pictures. Um, so in physical space, um, up and down are sort of just like the common sense up and down. They're just uh, 180 degrees apart. Uh, so that's like, you know, any six-year-old would know that. <clears throat> uh, but then in our state space, because up and down uh, are orthogonal in the state space, they're actually 90 degrees apart. Um, so you can kind of see in the physical space and the state space, there's kind of like an angle doubling between these two spaces. Um, and we'll see that means that when you rotate a, a state um, all the way around here, we actually only get like a, a negative sign here. So I'll show what that means. 
Um, so kind of what I just drew, like when we do a 180 degree rotation in physical space, uh, that's just a 90 degree rotation in state space. So is this, this is a little bit weird, but do people sort of understand how there's two different spaces here? Yeah, I wanted to say that actually we have seen that already in Road to Reality book when Penrose tried to talk about two state systems. So you kind of have seen that thing there where he was talking about yeah, real like this... directions in the space and spin. Yeah, like this, if you've ever heard of the block sphere, what I'm basically describing is the block sphere. I'm just trying to like draw it a little bit more easy to understand. Um, and then, yeah, so when we do a flip, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, yeah, I personally found this, uh, these, these pictures very, very helpful. So yeah, and yeah. I, I wanted to add a small note that basically you should think about the physical space as like 3d space. So you kind of have 3d sphere on the left and state space is actually like two dimensional complex space. So basically you have 4D space, it's kind of four dimensional there. So uh, you shouldn't be uh, kind of, uh, you, you shouldn't think about that as a plane, I think. So it's kind of more involved space. Yeah, so like I, what, I have a whole bunch of pictures. I basically show the up, down, left, right states, but there's obviously a forward and backward states too. And that's kind of harder to draw so I left it out, but yeah, like this, I'm kind of simplifying by only doing up, down, left, right here. Um, so yeah, so here we have a full th rotation in physical space and that only causes the uh, spin up state. It actually goes to negative up, which sounds kind of dumb, but uh, this, this negative, negative one is like a global phase factor of e to the i pi. So up and negative up correspond to the same physical state because it's, it's just a global phase factor in the state space that separates them. <clears throat> um, and then if we do another half rotation, we're back at down in physical space. And then this gives us negative down. Again, that's just a complex phase factor. Um, so down and negative down both correspond to the down state in physical space. And then uh, two rotations in physical space bring us back to the original spin state um and then i think i wanted to show this uh with the left and right states as well so um it turns out that the this is the right state so the right state basically has an equal probability of collapsing onto up and down um so basically the probability amplitudes are one over the square root two one over square root two um so when you square them these are like the alpha and beta that we square before. So when you square them, you get a half probability each. So that's why the state is uh, looks like this. And um, basically, this just gives a triangle where uh, you know you have one over square root two here and one over square root two here. Um, just if you think of these as like the two axes in the coordinate system. Um, and you'll notice again, this is a 45 degree rotation. So we have this like double angle relationship between state space and physical space. Um, and I basically just kind of show going around the circles. There's always this angle doubling relationship. This is the left state. Um, you know, this is, I, I don't even know if this is 135 and then this is 270. Uh, so yeah, we've kind of seen this before. This is again, right to negative right, it's just a complex phase factor. And then left and negative left, it's just a complex phase factor. So they both correspond to physical left. So that sort of explains why spinners, they don't live in physical space, they live in the state space. So that's why they have this sort of like, you rotate once in physical space and you get a negative sign in state space. So any, any questions there? Why okay. is it this I, way? But maybe we'll get to that later. Why is it this way? Yeah. Is it um, just a mathematical thing? Uh, the... Well, the so thing? like, I think it has to do with um, in the Stern Gerlach experiment. Like, I think I think you can like prepare an upstate, and then if you make it choose between uh, left and right, 
you you find that it you get like 50% each. Um, and so that's why you're forced to conclude this. Now you could also do the same thing with like forward, which is like uh, forward and backward. If you think of this as like plus X and minus X, this might be plus Y and minus Y. Um, and I think you need to like get into complex numbers which th this is why it's harder to draw the state space because you need to start getting like a complex numbers. I forget what the amplitudes are. I don't know if they're like uh, one over square root two and is it I over square root two? I'm a bit rusty on that, but you, you need to introduce complex numbers in order to get this like 50% um, relationship going. Yeah, so, so I, I was thinking more specifically about the, the difference between the physical space and, or the state space this description is that just an artifact the the angular difference that it's uh, double or half uh, is that just because we're using complex numbers well so i i, I don't exactly know like i'm probably just going to repeat what i said before where like up and down or are orthogonal that's just kind of a rule in quantum mechanics so that means that the axes for up and down have to be at right angles yeah i, I, I can don't, i don't know what else to say there i i can spoiler you a bit and say to you that actually on the right uh you you should think about a three-dimensional sphere in four-dimensional space so basically that's su2 group and on the left you should think about rotations in the real 3d space so it's basically s2 so you have s2 on the left and s3 on the right and actually S3 is glued uh, two co copies of S2. So basically uh, kind of one full turn over S2 equals half a turn over S3. So basically you have different dimensional spheres there and one full turn over three dimensional sphere equals two full turns on the uh, two dimensional sphere. So that's it. That's that's why you have that double covering. So basically, the key to that concept, to that double encircling, is the double covering nature of SU two and uh, SO three uh, groups. Yeah, I, I kind of I, I think I get into SU two and SO three later. Um, I feel like that's kind of like a, a kind of a complicated yeah, way yeah. of saying it. So Maybe easier. You, you will see on the next slides pretty soon. I think they will follow up uh, right now. Uh, you will see the uh, like theta over two uh, dependence in the formulas. So basically you will have the uh, physical space angle divided by two. And a simple explanation for it is that dependence. So the, uh, I think one way to connect it to yeah. what we've covered so far in this in this talk is the um, is the probability is really the square of the amplitude, and so because of that, uh, if you were to take alpha and beta, those components of the uh, of the spinner, if you were to take alpha and beta and rewrite those as i alpha and i beta, you would actually get the same results in physical space because you end up squaring them, so the minus signs go away. So that that's how we that's how we can describe this sort of double cover idea in terms of just the probabilities. It's it's because we're squaring it. Okay. Yeah, that's really helpful. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, it's also how 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 is it called? Like uh, B, like it's like bilinearity basically in the uh, psi dependence. So you have kind of bilinear form there uh, in the scalar product. Yeah. Okay. So I might I might move on and yeah. hopefully uh, yeah, yeah. Let's continue. things think, will get yeah, clearer yeah. or like more mathematically clear. Uh, okay. So um, now um, I said before we need like alpha and beta to describe like a two state complex system, and alpha and beta are both complex numbers. Um, so complex being like real plus imaginary. So this kind of makes us think we need four real numbers to describe a spin state. So like alpha real, alpha imaginary, 
and then uh, beta real, beta imaginary. Or you can also, as I've written here, done like phase and magnitude. So this is the magnitude of alpha and the phase of alpha, and then the magnitude of beta and the phase of beta. Um, so I'm assuming we've all seen like complex numbers written like this, right? That's that's nothing new. Um, but there's some kind of so there's some tricks we can do here. So um, what I've done here is I factored out e to the i phi alpha, so it just came right out of here. And then to factor it out here, I just uh, put put a e to the negative phi alpha here. So like if we distributed this this in. Uh, the angles would just cancel and we just get one. So that's that's how I factored that out. And of course, as we know, the overall phase um, can be ignored in a state. So this is kind of a number that we can ignore. Um, and then also, uh, R alpha and R beta are not independent because of the probability normalization constraint. So basically what this means is even though there's four numbers, for real numbers because of the uh, rule where we ignore the phase and because of probability normalization, we can kind of narrow it down to two real numbers. So I think I talk about that more here. So as you can see, uh, yeah, we can ignore a global phase factor. And then um, if we can look at the state space here and we have some state phi, uh, if we have, now I've, I've written theta over two because theta is like the real world angle as opposed to the state space angle. So if we have a real world angle of theta, uh, the angle here will be theta over two. Um, and then R alpha and R beta would just be like the components of, of this sort of. Um, and that means that we can write uh, both of them in terms of an angle. So cos, I hope I've gotten this right. Cosine is, uh, oh god, Sakatoa. Is it adjacent over hypotenuse? Yeah, that's, so that, did, that's, did that's all get... right. Yeah, that's all right. OK. I'm trying to make sure I got this right. So yeah, this is the adjacent, and then this is the hypotenuse. So that's cos. And then sine is uh, the opposite over the hypotenuse. OK. One mistake I didn't make. And then uh, we're going to rewrite this as just some uh, phase phi. Um, so by ignoring the global phase and by using this probability normalization, uh, we can basically write the state using only two real numbers, which is the phi, which is the physical space angle, and then this relative phase, or sorry, the theta is the physical angle, and then phi is the relative phase between the two up and down states. Um, so yeah, so basically, even though in theory there's only four complex numbers because of the con or four real numbers because of these constraints, we can only we uh, can narrow it down to two real numbers. Um, and so yeah, I guess I do talk about the block sphere here. So this is like a physical uh, space. You can see this this zero is basically spin up, and this one is basically spin down. Uh, so these are opposites, as you would expect in physical space. Um, and then this phi is basically uh, kind of like a polar coordinate coming down from the z-axis. And then this phi is kind of like a rotation in the xy plane. Um, and again, because these are states in the state space, we have the angle to phi over 2 instead. Uh, so I tried to give an example, I think. So, you know, what state would we get if the physical angle is 90 degrees and then the xy plane rotation is zero? Um, so we just plug in uh, pi over 2 into these sine and cos and then e to the i0, that just goes to 1. Uh, so this is cos of pi over 4 and sine of pi over 4, I think, is just 1 over the square root 2. Um, and I think this is just the x state that we've seen before. Uh, so this kind of makes sense, where if we're starting here and we come down uh, theta equals pi over 2, uh, we just get our x, our x plus x state mm -hmm. here. Um, I think you could, also, you could also write that as like the right state. Uh, mm -hmm. So does this sort of make sense? It, it, it is a little bit confusing, but it's, it's how it works. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And 
I just wanted to add that you can see that physical rotation by theta equals pi over 2 in the spinner space equals to the rotation of p over 4 there. So that's kind of it. Right, OK. Um, yeah, and then there's this paper I think a lot of us have seen. I think it's just called Introductions to Spinners. And they visualize a spinner as like a flagpole. So this is sort of like our block sphere again, where this is up and this is down in physical space. Um, but instead of just having like a line to the surface of the sphere, they also give it a flag, which you can kind of rotate. Um, uh, this is a different alpha than the alpha I was talking about before, but basically you can kind of spin this uh, around using a, an angle alpha, and you can also change the length of the flagpole using R. Um, so in this, yeah, so they have like R, theta, phi, and alpha. So theta and phi are just the usual sphere coordinates we've seen before on the last slide. Um, and then R is the length of the flagpole. So normally we use the constraint that we normalize the probability to one, but um, I guess if you ignore that probability constraint, you can make R as long as you want, and that can make the flagpole be as long as you want. And then um, alpha is the flag orientation, and that's basically the global phase factor. So normally we ignore that, right? So like um, basically if I have uh, like a flag like this, and then I want, and I don't know, this is like a state psi, and then I want to apply like a, a global phase factor to it, um, that might cause the flag to like rotate. I'm not very good at art. Um, but basically, when, when you have a state represented by this pole, uh, the complex phase doesn't move the pole. It's just like spinning the flag around. So it doesn't actually change the physical state. It just kind of makes it spin in place. Um, so before I said there's like four real numbers, basically R and alpha are kind of not necessarily needed, but you can kind of visualize them if you want as the length of the flagpole and the angle of the flag. So is that sort of clear? Yeah. Yeah. Have you yeah, thought okay. about uh, this interpretation? I mean, like why flex and do they remind you about something? Uh, I don't know. Is that like a trick question? <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't really know why why they came up with this interpretation. Yeah, yeah. I'm. I'm. I just was thinking about that, and I was interested. Maybe someone also noticed the similarities. Uh, so, like that flagpole um, analogy is basically uh, like why do we have a flag? So like to have a, only a flagpole, only that stick, it's kind of the same as to have an orientation, an axis in space. But why to have flag? And I think the answer is that flag construction actually describes the 3D rotation. So basically that's an element of SO3. The rotation is in 3D space. Because to fix the rotation, you all you need is the axis, so it's a flagpole, and then you need the amount of rotation along that axis. And that's the alpha there. So you need a flag. And the flags, they define elements of SO3 actually. So that's kind of spinner representation in 3D space, in physical space. Okay, so you're saying that like if we keep R equals one, but but keep alpha, that's like an axis angle representation of a rotation. Yes, kind yes, of. yes. And also, there is one more analogy. Uh, and actually, we have seen that in Road to Reality book, in chapter 15 uh, and subchapter 4 there, so 15.4, uh, it was about hop vibration. And actually, hop vibration is a great example here. Uh, but anyway, uh, at the middle of the chapter, Penrose talks about the... Um, Tan tangential fields, like tan tangent fields to the sphere. So basically what you have here is the same as a tangent vector to a sphere. So flagpole defines a point on a sphere and alpha takes a vector from the tangent space. 
So that's one more analogy, which opened the door to the hop vibration here, actually. So. Okay, I'm I'm pretty rusty on the hop vibration, but that's an interesting thing I'll have to uh, look into. Yeah, so it kind of have, uh, uh, how to say, the, co the connection to differential geometry, actually, uh, and to the kind of tangent fields on a sphere, basically. W one more analogy to attach here. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you can definitely go in a lot of different directions, I think. Um, which is maybe why it's so hard to fit this into one talk. Um, yeah, so I think the paper writes it a little bit differently. Um, like if you have like the spinner state A and B, those are like the coefficients for up and down. Um, I think it kind of like splits the R between both of them and also splits the alpha between both of them. And like you have like these, yeah, like, like I put phi just on the down state, I think. Um, and like alpha would be like the global state, the global rotation out in front, but it kind of like splits between both of them to make them even. Um, so that, yeah, I just thought I'd bring that up. Um, yeah, so basically this is sort of like the information we need. And then this is sort of like the extra information where like R should probably be one and we could ignore our global phase. Um, so basically, yeah, in quantum mechanics, we ignore global scaling because of normalization and we ignore global phase because, um, yeah, like all the probabilities end up being real and like the complex phase doesn't matter. Um, so this means that any state in quantum mechanics is equivalent to another state when it's multiplied by an arbitrary complex number C, where like C is like the scaling and the global phase. Um, so the spinner state space is... I think you call it the complex projective line. Um, it's basically like uh, C, like the set of pairs of complex numbers where we ignore um, scaling by a complex by a complex number. Um, I'm not going to talk about that too much because again, that just goes off in a whole other direction. But I thought I would mention that. Um, yeah. Uh, now, so when we're wrote, oh, sorry, did someone have a question? Yeah, yeah, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that CP1 space. Uh, I, I was kind of a little bit confused because, um, like with Pauli spinners, uh, I always was thinking about C2 as the base, basic space, right? But, uh, like, from the physical perspective, we have that interpretation of the uh, two state functions like wave function like psi here and uh, the equivalence between the proportional ones uh, so cp1 is actually the same as s2 here right and it will kind of yeah i think like topologically they're equivalent yeah yeah so basically it will correspond to that sphere we have seen already like to the block sphere it, it will be kind of the same. So CP1 is, in reality, it is a physical space and C2 is spinor space. So it seems to me that calling CP1 spinor state space is not correct here. Like, it, it doesn't sound yeah, correct Yeah, that, that might be true, yeah. So it's, it seems to me that you should have like a physical state space here instead of spinor state space in the last line. Yeah, maybe that's maybe that's a good point because you can you you we'll we'll see later. You can add spinners together to get new spinners, and like if they're just trapped on a sphere, then you can't do that. You can't add spinners, but adding spinners is something you can do. Um, so yeah, this is an example of like I've just made like a hundred slides, and I wasn't really careful. So sorry about that. Thank you for. Uh, don't worry, don't me. worry. I've been thinking about that also for a long time. <laughs> That's totally fine. Okay, so um, yeah, now I wanted to talk about rotating a spinner. So if we're rotating like the up state to like the right state or something like that, um, we do it with some operation U, which you could think of as like a matrix. Um, and we need to preserve probability, um, you know, like the normalize the probability to one. Uh, so if we have this constraint and we do this transformation, then the ket transforms with a u, and then the bra transforms with the Hermitian adjoint of u, which is this dagger here. 
Um, so basically, if we want these two things to be the same, this sort of implies that uh, u dagger times u is equal to the identity, um, which is another way of saying the inverse of u is u dagger. So that's the the inverse is the Hermitian adjoint. Um, so like I think like a really simple example might be um, this matrix here. Um, is that right? No, that's. I'm trying to think if that would actually work. I think I have examples later, so maybe don't don't trust me too much on that one. Um, uh, but yeah, so basically when we're when we're rotating spinners, um, yeah, we have this. We're, we're we're forcing the rotation operation to be unitary, which means the uh, the uh, inverse of the matrix is its Hermitian adjoint. If this was real, then uh, we would we would say it was the transpose. So that's like I think that's what you call orthogonal matrices. But since we're in the complex world, we need unitary. So we use the dagger instead of the transpose. Um, also, uh, so we have this now uh, using the determinant rule. We just know that like the like if we take the determinant of both sides, uh, that's you know, the determinant is like, I don't know what the word is, like multiplicative or something, but you can, the determinant of a product is the product of the determinants. Um, now the determinant of u dagger is just the complex conjugate of the determinant of u, and then the determinant of the identity is obviously one. So we end up with the squared magnitude of the determinant of u is one, and since the magnitude of a complex number is always positive. That's the same thing as just saying the magnitude of the determinant is one. Um, so, so that means that the determinant of u has to be a complex phase of, of magnitude one, basically. Uh, so that's true for unitary matrices. Um, now the thing is, we can always remove. I'm sort of reusing Greek letters here. Uh, this is not like a probability beta. This is just some angle beta. Uh, we can always remove a phase factor from u without changing the sort of the probability. Um, so if we have u and we write it as like this script u, we can always pull a complex phase factor out. And if we get our probability and or like we yeah, so this is the probability and then we like rotate the state uh, again using u dagger and u, um, this would and if we apply this transformation here, or, or this isn't really a transformation, it's just pulling a phase factor out. Um, this, we get this phase factor here, and then uh, because of the dagger, uh, we pull a negative phase out of the other one. Um, and then those two interfaces just cancel, and so we get this. Um, so I don't know if that was a bit hard to follow, but the point I'm making is that because probabilities are like, uh, like psi acting on psi, uh, we can always change the phase of a matrix. Like we can, if it's if it has some phase like that, we can always pull a phase factor out and change it so that we get a determinant of of plus one. Um, I'm sorry if I was a bit incoherent there. Does does that fall? Do people follow that? How we can always pull a phase factor out to change the determinant? Or am I kind of confusing people? So I'm like, not really. on, on the previous slide, you obtained that determinant uh, will be equal to the unitary or like unit complex number, right? Yeah. And what, yeah, what I'm trying to say is that like, if we, if we have U, we can always factor it into like some other U and, uh, and like a phase factor. Um, like, like the argument I'm trying to make is that like phase factors on U don't change like the probabilities here, because like any phase factor you put on U is just going to cancel here. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it's it's kind of yeah, it's it's, it's understandable. Uh... But I think I think maybe one other thing I should say is like if I have like a matrix A, B, C, D, and I multiply it by a phase and then take the determinant. 
um, because this goes to every single element when we take the determinant uh, this ends up multiplying the determinant by like the square because it's a two by two matrix um, so basically when you take the determinant you get this factor twice uh, so so basically yeah uh, I don't know if I don't know if this argument is clear but like yeah, if you apply a phase to a to this unitary matrix, the probability doesn't change. So does uh, I, I feel like I probably am I didn't explain it great on this slide. Um, yeah. Are people kind of okay with this, or is it confusing? I I personally have a small confusion with this. Um basically because I think I understand this argument from a physical point of view but I'm not sure that I understand this from like a mathematical perspective I, I, I mean like uh, I am kind of more intended to think about the rotations in C2 uh, like just SU2 group so I, I, I'm kind of just know the answer <laughs> It's, it's kind of right, cheating. Yeah, you're kind of thinking ahead. Yeah, yeah, I'm kind of cheating okay, here. Maybe... So maybe, maybe there's I a freedom will, to I'm choose just... your. There's a freedom to choose what direction you, you start with. Essentially, what this is uh, mathematically. There's no absolute. Um. Well, that's not a way to, way to say it. Yeah. So so that's also about the global face. The same thing, right? Like. Uh, when you rotate the whole world, kind of. Yeah, so I'm I'm gonna try like actually going through this because uh, it's a bit confusing. So we all know the determinant of a two by two matrix is just like that minus that, right? So it's AD minus BC. That's that's fine. Um, so let's what watch what happens when I take a phase times U. So this is like E to the I B. A, E to the I, or sort of beta, E to the I, beta, B, E to the I, beta, C, E to the I, beta, D. Now, if I take the determinant of E to the I, beta, U, I get um, E to the I, beta, oh, sorry, uh, A times E to the I, beta, D minus E to the I, beta, uh, B, e to the i beta c. Um, so basically I get e to the i beta squared times a d minus b c, which is just e to the i beta, I'm sorry for my handwriting, squared times the original determinant of u. So the argument I'm trying to make is like, if u has a determinant of e to the i alpha, if I were to multiply u by e to the i, uh, I guess minus alpha over two, and then take the determinant, uh, this would be equal to using this, um, e to the i negative i alpha over two squared, and then the determinant of the original u is just e to the i alpha. Um, and so this, the square and the half cancel, so this is just e to the minus i alpha, e to the plus i alpha, which is plus one. Does that make sense from like an algebra point of view? Mm, yeah, yeah. So the argument I was trying to make and I made really poorly on the previous slide is that um, like when we have a unitary matrix, we can always multiply it by a phase to force the determinant to be one, is what I was trying to say. That's what I was like trying to say, and I said it badly. And the thing is, these global phase factors don't change real life probabilities. So um, the argument I'm trying to make is, even though unitary in theory uh, has a determinant of like a phase factor, um, in practice, because of we can eliminate global phase factors, we can kind of pretend the determinant is just positive one. 
because phase factors don't change probabilities. Does that make it better? Yeah, I think we should continue on. Yeah, okay. So so basically the fancy thing I'm trying to say is instead of saying U um, or like U2, instead of two by two unitary matrices for doing rotations, I'm trying to argue it's actually SU2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Special unitary, meaning the determinant is plus one. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I was trying to say. Um, yeah, so rotations can be done by unitary transformations with determinant plus one, um, is what I was trying to say. Um, and again, yeah, so that means that the matrix U is part of SU2. So like this, this top property alone kind of makes it seem like U is just part of U2, the two by two unitary matrices. But in the world of quantum mechanics, where phase factors don't matter, we can sort of ignore the phase factor and just say the determinant is plus one, which actually turns it into SU2, not U2. Uh, so how do people feel about that? I'm getting silence, which is not, not super <laughs> encouraging. Yeah, it, 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 it's actually like hard to argue currently. So. Uh, I have a small confusion with this, but I feel that I have enough strength to continue. So it's not a big problem for me personally. Okay. All right. Okay. So, so spinner rotations, um, about an angle, uh, theta in physical space are given by, so in the spinner state space, these are given by two by two complex matrices with the half angle, which also belong to SU2. Um, so I think you can go and prove, uh, I didn't include the proofs, but you can prove that rotating around the three axes, X, Y, Z, these are all members of SU2. So, um, so like, like for example, uh, in SU2, like the determinant of all of these is one. I think you can check that because like cos squared plus sine squared equals plus one. Um, and also, if you take the transpose conjugate, you get the inverse. Um, so here, this one's real, uh, ry is real, so the inverse is just the transpose. You don't need to worry about the conjugate. Um, here, when you take the inverse conjugate or the transpose conjugate, you just reverse the signs of the i's, and then that would give you your inverse. Um, Rx is probably the hardest one to imagine, but you can check if you, the transpose does nothing, but then the conjugate will uh, change these minuses to pluses, and then you'll find that that's the inverse of the original matrix. So I guess I was using an abstract argument. I could have just shown you these matrices right away, but I wanted to show you why they work. It's because to preserve probabilities, we need unitary and we can ignore global phase to get determinant one. And those two properties basically give you these three matrices for doing rotations. Um, and then I think I have an actual real example. Oh, I'm gonna actually, uh, I didn't uh, yeah, yeah. the animation order properly. Uh, I, I, so I I'm want, going to- I wanted to ask a question about those three matrices. Like- uh, Sure. How you deduce those? Like, where do you get them? Uh, I kind of took a shortcut. Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't actually go through the full proofs, honestly. Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, 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 like this presentation I just wanted enough. to note that you can notice that those three matrices, uh, if you take those close to zero, uh, I, I mean, like, if you take theta close to zero there, C can you move back one slide just for yeah. illustration? You're talking about like the Lie groups and the Lie algebras. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you right? take those uh, transformation as infinitesimal ones, like a really small ones, uh, for example, take Rx and set theta equals zero in there. And you will see that for zero, you will obtain like I identity matrix, right? Yeah, for zero it will be identity, okay. And for others, 
Ah, yeah, so yeah, I, might, be, I, might I, I, I forgot to say, yeah, because uh, that will happen. Yeah, yeah. So basically those matrices, they are exponentiated poly matrices. So they are not poly matrices themselves. Actually, you need to take the derivative. Yeah. So you need to take the derivative yeah, of those. You're kind of jumping ahead. Uh, I, I didn't think I would get to Lie groups and Lie algebras today, Okay, okay, but, okay. Yeah. Let's... So like if you put in theta equals zero, these become the identity, which makes sense. Like rotating by an angle of zero is the identity. But if you take the derivative and then set theta to zero, which I'm not going to show, but these become the Pauli matrices. Yeah, that's true. Um, and I believe. basically those... Uh... R, R, X, R, 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 X, R, Y, and R, Z matrices, they will correspond to the uh, physical space rotations. Uh, the same rotational matrices you will get, uh, like, 3 by 3 matrices in 3D space. Yeah, so, like, everything you're talking about now is in, like, this slide, like, 130 or something. I didn't want to go there yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, like, okay. The, my point is we can get to these matrices without invoking Lie algebras and stuff. We can sort of, like use this argument of just want to preserve probabilities, ignore global phase factors. We can use very like physics-y concepts to arrive at these. Okay, so uh, what I was trying to show is, um, so in that paper with the spinner flags, uh, like the top standard top flag is just like zero one. I wanted to show some examples. So if this is our up flag with the spin up, um, we could rotate it by 90 degrees by multiplying. Uh, this is Rx with like theta equals 90. Um, so this was like cos on the diagonal and negative i, and negative I sine on the other diagonal. Uh, so if we put this here, this basically just tells us to take the first column, I think. Yeah, so we just get the first column. And so, uh, yeah, I think you can see that here, this flag. Um, you'll notice there's another flag like this. It has a phase factor like that. So again, you ignore global phase factors, but you can use the global phase factor to spin the flag. Um, and then I think I rotate by 90 around the z-axis. So, um, so the, the, if we apply this 1 and minus i here, uh, so basically this just gets applied to the one, so we get e to the negative i pi over four, and this gets applied to the negative i, so we get negative i uh, e to the i pi over four. But i, if you recall, is just e to the i pi over two, because it's like a, it's like a pi over two rotation in the complex plane. So if you set i to pi over 2. Um, oh, this is negative i, actually, so it's negative pi over 2. Sorry about that. So that's actually going in the other direction. And the negative pi over 2 and the positive i pi over 4. Whoop, what happened there? Nope, I don't want this, whatever it is. What happened? Okay. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, so basically you can you can just set this to one one, and if you do all the canceling with the phases, you can factor out this um, this number here. So this flag isn't actually pictured, the one I've drawn, um, but you can see it's just a global phase factor of this one one state. So it's the same state just with the flag spun. And then I think I do one more. Uh, so that's, I'm, I'm rotating the state, uh, pi over four, one, one, and then, uh, I'm not going to go through the algebra, but I get this and you'll notice it's just, uh, the original state with the, with the, with the flag spun by some phase factor. So I realize if you actually want to believe any of this, you would probably have to get a pen and paper and work through it yourself. But I just wanted to give a quick example of like these rotation matrices actually work. They actually spin the flag in the way that you would expect. Okay, so 
Uh, that's end of part one, and it took an hour, so we are not getting through to part four. We might get through to the end of part two if we're lucky. Uh, did anyone have any uh, part one questions? So basically, um, I guess we kind of, what did we learn? We learned that like uh, we have to, you know, normalize everything to one. Uh, if two states are mutually orthogonal, or if they're like impossible to get from each other, they're at like 90 degrees in the state space. And that leads to like sort of like half angle rotations. And then uh, we proved that to rotate a state, uh, we end up with this uh, U inverse equals U transpose. And because we're sort of applying phi on itself, uh, we can force the determinant of U to be plus one. Uh, so that means that rotations for the spinners belong to SU2, which are the two by two unitary matrices with determinant one. And then we had that whole like flagpole picture where this is sort of like the global phase. Um, yeah, so uh, does anyone have any like questions for this, this section? I think this was a really good coverage of, of the uh, foundations here. And so, Joe, could, uh, Joe sorry, point. it's really hard to hear you. Could you put your microphone closer, please? Yeah, let me try. Can you hear me better now? Only a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I can hear you. You, you sound good to me, but uh, maybe Slava can't hear you. Oh, I, I see. All right. I, yeah, I just checked my mic. I, th I think I'll go on. Um, but yeah, so I, I think this was really good coverage of the of the foundations. And then there was there was one comment about uh, mutually exclusive uh, on on one of the earlier slides. Uh, I think there is a uh, this only adds jargon, so maybe it's unnecessary. But uh, the the term would be a complete orthonormal basis for the uh, for the state space. Okay. So complete orthonormal basis okay yeah so complete means that like those vectors will span the whole state space uh orthonormal means that they're uh, that uh they meet the conditions that you drew like first on this slide so normal meaning that they have an amplitude of one and orthonormal meaning that if you project one onto the other and they're orthogonal it'll be zero Right, yeah. So I was kind of hoping, uh, yeah, this would this would have gone faster, but I just made way too many slides because this part one is. It, I don't think it's really anything new for most people. It might just be going over it more slowly, so that you can actually wrap your head around it. Um, but there isn't anything like too crazy here compared to like Road to Reality. I don't think. Yeah, anyway, I think that it's really important to focus on that part, uh, at, at least a bit, because uh, it contains a lot of different simple but interesting uh, perspectives. And uh, I, I wanted to add also uh, to the previous slide, to the last slide we have seen with the flex example, that basically what you are seeing here is uh, kind of... Uh, the recreation of the parallel transport so you kind of parallel do you're doing parallel transportation of the flag actually and that's why it has pass dependence on the sphere and that's why it rotates uh, 90 degrees after the cycle closes so we have a curvature here so i'm i'm used to i didn't actually think of it that way i'm used to thinking about parallel transport in like general relativity can you like end up defining like a covariant derivative for like these flags? Does that end up being like an actual mathematical thing? I think that yes, something that, like, similar. No so uh, for example, you can take that flag into your hands and imagine you are standing in, at the North Pole with that flag. And then you go uh, to the right point on the great uh, circle. So you go to that like point on the right. And therefore your flag will just uh kind of be rotated the same way as on the picture above uh, so it will lie uh, uh like horizontally uh, looking to the right 
and afterwards you're going around the equator yeah just like you're drawing that and you will have the same the same uh, actually um, picture so basically what you're really doing you parallel transporting you, uh, you you're going through the tangential surfaces on a sphere there right yeah Okay, yeah, so that that might be like a whole other topic, um, but I might I might try and get through part two if that's okay. Yeah, let's go. So, let's go. Um, yeah, so I have like forty minutes, so we'll see how far we get. So this part might be a little bit new for some people. Um, okay, so I didn't put animations on this slide, I guess, but so like if we have a three D vector, th this is like by the way, this we're like totally changing gears and looking at something completely different, but we're going to find it comes back to spinners at the end. So you can almost forget about part one for now, but you'll start seeing some similarities. So um, I think we've heard of the sigma matrices. Uh, so uh, yeah, so we can interpret a 3D vector x, y, z as a two by two matrix. I'm not sure if road to reality covers that, but basically um, if you're familiar with these x, y, and z uh, Pauli matrices, um, basically they have the property that they all square to the identity. When I write one, I just mean like the, oops, I just mean like the two by two identity matrix. And then they also have the property that when you switch two of them, you switch the order, you get a minus sign out in front. So I'm kind of hoping you've seen the poly matrices before, and this is not surprising. Um, a way of summarizing all of this is this formula here where you say the anti-commutator of sigma i and sigma j, which means uh, i times j plus j times i is twice uh, Kronecker delta. So basically, if we had like sigma i anti-commutated with sigma i, then this would just give us uh, one plus one, which is two. So that's where the two comes from. But if they're different, then because of the anti-commuting rule, then you get zero. Um, so, so uh, if you're, do you remember the Kronecker delta, where if I, with the subscripts are the same, you get one, and if they're different, you get zero. Um, so, so this formula I find a bit confusing to read, but it's basically these uh, six formulas summarized, where you square to one, and then if you switch the order of two, then you you get a negative sign. So I'm hoping that's people already know this already. This isn't too crazy. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we have seen those okay. in the book, yeah. Right. So so there's this trick where you can write a three-dimensional vector as a two-by-two two complex matrix. And so all you do is you take the x, y, z components and write, treat the Pauli matrices almost like basis vectors. So you get x component times the x Pauli matrix, y component times the y Pauli matrix, z component times the z Pauli matrix. And you end up with this matrix here which is a Hermitian matrix. So if you transpose and conjugate it, you get the same thing. And also um, not, notice that it is traceless. Traceless, yeah. So all the, all the Pauli matrices are traceless, so a sum is traceless as well. Um, and then if you, you can show its determinant is the length squared. So uh, like the first diagonal is just z times minus z, and then we subtract x minus i y x plus i y and if you work all of that out you get uh negative x squared negative y squared negative z squared so that is a neat fact um i'm gonna kind of zoom through a few properties here if you go to the wikipedia article called spinners in three dimensions <clears throat> you'll see all of this like you can see they use x1 x2 x3 instead of x y z but um so i just showed the determinant is the length squared um also, you can try yourself, if you square this matrix, if you do x, x, uh, you get basically the magnitude of x squared on the diagonal, and then zeros off diagonal. So that's why they say it's like the length squared times the identity matrix. Um, you can also kind of fudge the dot product and the cross product, but I'm not going to worry about that. But the this fact that the determinant of x equals the negative length squared, and that uh, x squared equals uh, the length squared times the identity. We're going to use those two facts. Um, so you might ask, 
you know, if we rotate this, we've probably seen rotations before. We use like a like a three by three uh, rotation matrix, which I'm, I'm assuming you've seen those before. Um, you know, that one of those should be a plus sign, but you've probably seen three by three rotation matrices before. Um, now, a question is, how do we do a 3D rotation on this? So like the X, Y, Z components would all match up with what we would expect if we did a rotation on a 3D vector. Um, so the way we can determine that, um, we need the results to always be Hermitian. Um, so whatever we do to these X, Y, Z components, this matrix has to be Hermitian. Um, and since the determinant is the length squared or the negative length squared, we can't change the determinant when we do a rotation. And we also can't change the square. Um, so to figure out what a rotation, a 3D rotation on this two by two matrix would look like, we're going to have to make sure the result is Hermitian, make sure the determinant doesn't change and make sure the square doesn't change. Um, if that makes sense. So I'm gonna use these three properties to sort of narrow down what uh, a, a 3D rotation would look like. Um, so I don't have like a super duper formal proof, but I have sort of like 80% of a formal proof. So we're gonna start, we're gonna assume the 3D rotation is going to end up looking like a double-sided uh, operation with the matrix A and B acting on the left and the right. Um, so we need to figure out what these A and B matrices look like. So before so, I go on, is it sort of clear what we're doing? Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to ask why. So I have, I had a question while yeah. reading that about like why double sided. Uh, it was a bit confusing for me. Yeah, I, this is a thing where I just kind of ran out of time and I didn't do like a formal proof. Um, I don't know the exact reason. Um, yeah, we, we can skip them. I, let's, I, I, let's go. So, so. Here, I'm gonna jump ahead. I'm gonna give you a fun fact. If you take V and do this to it, you get a reflection. So if you, if you like double-sided apply a sigma matrix and put a negative sign, you get a, a reflection. Um, mm -hmm. I, don't, I can't mm -hmm. remember if I said rotation or reflection, but this gives you a reflection. Yeah, that gives you And yeah. two, two reflections results in a rotation, right? Like if I, take this flag and then reflect it a bit and then reflect it again, I get a rotation. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you can sort of use your intuition to, to argue that if you do two reflections, you get a rotation. So that's kind of an intuition reason why you're doing a double-sided transformation, but I don't have like a formal proof for why. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Um, I, I was just wondering so what will happen if we'll try to deduce one-sided transformations here. Uh, I don't have answer. Yeah, so I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah, so yeah, I, I basically, I'm just going to not answer that because I don't really have a great answer. Um, sorry. Uh, so, uh, so we're going, the first property is we're going to force V to be Hermitian. And so the results should also be Hermitian after. So we're going to force this transformed permission to be equal or yeah. So we're forcing this to be equal to this. Basically that's, we, we need to guarantee the result is permission afterward. Um, now, if you remember, if you have like the transpose of a B, uh, this ends up being, you just reverse the order. Uh, the same is true of like her, the permission because the permission is just the complex, the conjugate transpose. Um, and since V is Hermitian, we can just kind of cancel out the dagger. So basically to force, to force the Hermitian property, we need these two things to be equal. Um, uh, so basically we're saying like this daggered has to equal the original undaggered version. And this daggered after you do some algebra equals this. So again, this isn't really a formal proof. I didn't really have time. But this kind of suggests that the left matrix here, B dagger, is equal to A, and the A matrix, A dagger, is equal to B here. Um, so, but th these are kind of just two different ways of saying the same thing. Um, so, like A, A, uh, A, uh, B equals A dagger is, is basically 
what I'm trying to say here. Um, so using this Hermitian, when we're forcing the result to be Hermitian, we can kind of come to the conclusion that instead of having two different matrices, we're just using A and A dagger on both sides. So this isn't really a formal proof, but maybe it kind of in agrees with your intuition. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. So so we're kind of narrowing down. We're narrowing down with the form of what A looks like. Okay, so now uh, the determinant can't change because the determinant... Oh, no, sorry, I'm starting with the square. So the square of the matrix... Wait, what? Okay, this is a typo. Sorry. Again, 100 slides, I didn't have time. So determinant can't change is what I'm saying because um, the determinant corresponds to the length. So the determinant before has to equal the determinant after. Um, now, so again, we're using that rule where the product of the determinants equals the determinant of the products. And the determinant of A dagger is just the complex conjugate of the determinant of A. Um, so the det A and det A conjugate come together to give this. Um, and so, yeah, we have det V on the right, det V on the left. We have come to the conclusion that det A squared, or the magnitude of det A squared, um, has to be plus one. And since the magnitude is always a positive number anyway, we can forget the square and just say that the determinant of A is plus one. Um, and that gives us the conclusion that the determinant of A, since this is the magnitude, the determinant of A has to be a complex phase factor. Uh, so basically we're saying A has to belong to uh, uh, basically uh, unitary, I think, because the, uh, the complex phase factor, yeah, the determinant is always a complex phase factor. So we're saying A has to be a two by two unitary matrix. Um, now this might start ringing some bells for what we what we did before. Um, remember, like when we were trying to figure out the U matrix that would like spin our flag, um, it looked like it was going to be uh, like a determinant of a complex phase factor, but because we had psi on psi, uh, phase factors would cancel out, so we could ignore the phase factor. And if you'll notice, we're applying two A's here. So we can kind of do the same thing where if we give A a phase factor, um, A dagger gets the negative phase factor because like um, E to the IB uh, conjugated just gives E to the I beta. So if we take A and transform it using these A's with the phase factors, um, this is just a scalar so we can put it over here and then these two cancel. So what I'm really trying to say is, even though the determinant of A, uh, because of this property, the determinant of A looks like it has to be a phase factor, but because we're applying two A's, one on each side, the phase factor of A doesn't matter. So we can actually force, we can always pick an A where the determinant is plus one. So instead of A belonging to U2, uh, because we're doing a double-sided A transformation, we can actually say that A belongs to SU2. Um, so this is sort of an argument we saw before, but it's kind of in like a completely different context almost. Uh, so are people good with this? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, and then I think there's, yeah, so we've, we have the determinants as plus one. <coughs> so, question. sorry. I was just saying. I, I think Yuri had a question. Oh, Yuri, sorry. Did you have a question? Uh, no, no, it's it's fine. Okay. Um. Yeah, this argument. Now that I'm reading this slide, this looks like a bit a bit weird. Um, I'm not sure if we. Anyway, I'll just go through it. So remember, the square of V is the identity times the squared length. So if we, the, so the square of V can't change after we transform. So this should be equal to the square of V. Uh, we end up with A dagger A in the middle, and then this kind of suggests that um, we we have A dagger being the inverse of 
A. So now that I'm looking at this slide, uh, I don't I don't know how I feel about this argument, but um, I guess I'm arguing that these will cancel and you just get v squared in the middle, um, which again, v squared in the middle is just uh, the identity times this squared. And that can be pulled out in front, I guess, because it's just a diagonal matrix and therefore it commutes with everything. Um, and then this A and A dagger can and A inverse cancels. So sorry, now that I'm looking at this, I don't know how I feel about this slide, but I think I'm trying to argue that, uh, yeah, I guess I'm trying to argue that A is unitary or, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sorry, uh, I don't know. I. The, the, this this presentation is definitely not perfect, but um, that's that's the argument I came up with. So, yeah, basically uh, maybe it was like to switch. It was better choice to switch the, the slides, maybe like to show first that it is unitary and afterwards show the determinant yeah, equals to one. Yeah, but yeah, that no, kind that, of you're, you're you're totally right. Yeah, that's, that's, that doesn't but matter. Anyway, yeah, yeah. So I'm hoping that you can believe, even though I said that in a very wrong way, that. Um, so if we use the fact that V is Hermitian, the determinant is the squared length and the square gives you the identity times the squared length, you can you know, take on your own time, you can do a better job than I did, but you can sort of prove the transformation takes this double-sided form with A dagger and A on either side. Uh, the determinant of A is plus one and it's unitary. So I went through all of that to show that when we wanna rotate, this two by two matrix, we do it on either side with uh, special unitary matrices. Um, and I guess the interesting thing is a unit vector U, so like, I don't know, something like 0 0.6, 0 0.80, that's a unit vector, because like 0 0.6, that's like, if you square them, you get 0 0.36, 0 0.64, and that gives one, so u is a unit vector. Um, then its sort of two by two version will always belong to SU2. Um, so basically when we're, when we're transforming V to do a rotation, um, we basically take V um, as a two by two matrix and then operate on both sides with uh, the equivalent of a unit vector in the two by two matrix form, which ends up being a member of SU2. Okay, so I, I feel like I kind of botched that explanation, but do people feel okay moving on? Do we have any questions? Yeah, I think, I think it's good. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah, so I guess, I guess I included this too. Um, so I talked about this before. If U is a unit vector, then the double-sided application with a negative side in front uh, gives a reflection. And again, if we do two reflections, then we get a rotation. Um, so that's sort of like another way of thinking about why we need a double-sided transformation. Um, I'm not sure if I want to go through this I'll just go through it quickly, I guess. So like a unit vector in 3D can sort of represent a plane, like the plane orthogonal to it. Um, and if we want to reflect a vector V, like say we have this vector V and we want to reflect it in the plane to get, you know, V, like some other V, V prime, uh, you, you do that you can do that by reflecting it in the plane represented by the unit vector. And doing that in the matrix way uh, looks like this. So you basically apply U on both sides and then, yeah, put a negative sign in front. Um, and then I basically argue that a rotation is just two reflections. Um, and I think, I think the argument here is that uh, if I take the uh, if I take the dagger of u2, u1, this gives u1 dagger, u2 dagger. Uh, and then I think, 
I'm trying to remember here. Would a would a unit vector always give a Hermitian matrix, or am I crazy? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. Yeah. So here we go. So so you, if u is a unit vector, then its determinant is one. And then, uh, since we have u dagger equals u inverse, does that mean that u is its own inverse? Am I? Unitary and Hermitian would be self-inverse. Okay. Mm, I'm tr I think I also botched up this explanation a little bit. I'm sorry about this. That's okay. So mm. what um, are you trying to show that it's unitary, Hermitian, or both? Well, I was trying to show that like this this u1 u2 uh when you dagger it would give you just u1 u2 in the opposite order where u u1 and u2 are are unitary but they have a determinant of one i see i think they'd also have to be her mission hmm. Uh, I'm sorry about this. I, I, I feel like I, I tried to do too much, and I some in some slides I just didn't do a particularly good job. Oh, you have to okay, be maybe. Sorry, this is, this is so great. <laughs> okay, I mean, you might have to like go back and fill in some of the gaps here. Okay, so so this I gave some like actual real examples, so this might make it more concrete. Um, so we're gonna try reflecting a two by two vector in the xy plane. So if we have v, uh, we can reflect v in the xy plane by double siding it with like the z vector, basically, because um, sigma z is sort of like the unit z vector. So our matrix v looks like this. It's just like x sigma x y sigma y. This is like the standard two by two matrix we've been talking about. Um, and I'm not actually going to write out the matrix form. Um, I'm just going to use the properties that we know from the Pali matrices. Uh, so we just put in V in the middle here. And then we, we basically just put negative sigma Z and sigma Z on both sides. So you can see we've done that here with a negative sign, uh, two sigma Z's with a negative, and then two sigma Z's with a negative. Now, uh, then what I do in the X case, I switch the order Oop, no, that's not what I did. Sorry. I switched the order of these two, and that changes it to a plus sign because we know sigma matrices anti commute. And then I do that same thing here, and that changes it to a plus sign. And now with Z, um, because all the Zs are the same, uh, like the order doesn't really matter. So the sign actually stays negative in the Z case. Um, so. Basically, uh, in the X case, because we did this flip, we got a plus sign, and then the two sigma Zs multiply to give one. That's just the standard property of the sigma matrices. They multiply to give one. And then same things happen here. Those multiply to give one, and then those multiply here to give one. So you can see what basically happened is the X term stayed the exact same. The Y term stayed the exact same but the Z term got a negative sign in front. So this is sort of a showing that when we double side a vector with like a Z unit vector, we get a reflection for the Z component, or that's also a, a reflection in the X, Y plane. Um, so, so basically I'm trying to say that Sigma X and Sigma Y are not affected by a negative conjugation by Sigma Z. But on the other hand, sigma z flips sign when it's negative conjugated with itself. So um, that abstract slide that I had before was trying to say this for a reflection in a more abstract way. But hopefully this more concretely shows you that this type of thing does a reflection. So does that, does that make more sense? Yeah. Yeah, OK. And then I think I do a rotation as well. Yeah, so um, if I basically, if I have V and I reflect in the x-axis, and then I reflect again in the y-axis, 
uh, the negative signs cancel out. So you just basically do this and you got to pay attention that the order is reversed here. We have X, Y and or Y, Z, Y, X and X, Y. So I think Slava was asking why not do a single sided transformation. So this is maybe sort of an explanation why I'm going to try doing a single sided rotation and see what happens. Um, so we just, you know, take our, our vector and then put this in. Um, so here, uh, I think I just leave that term alone. Here, I'm going to switch this y and x to give it a negative sign. And I think here, I actually do two switches. I think I bring z over and then z over, so those two switches are a negative and then another negative, so the sign stays the same. Um, and then this becomes 1, sigma x, sigma x. This becomes 1, sigma y, sigma y. And this actually just stays as it is. So if you take a look at this term, this does look like a rotation, like we're using x, y, right? We're using x, y. This does look like a rotation by 90 degrees in the x, y plane. But we kind of run into this problem where Z doesn't look like the way it should. Like we have three sigmas instead of just a sigma Z. So the single-sided transformation kind of gives us the wrong answer. Um, but if we do a double-sided transformation, uh, this is, I'm sure, really painful to look at because um, there's five sigmas. But basically, if you want to trust me, this x gets a negative, this y gets a negative, and then this z gets a positive, and then we can like cancel a bunch of them to just one. And we get, um, what we actually get is uh, a rotation by 180 degrees in the xy plane, and the z component isn't changed at all. If we're rotating around the z axis, the z axis shouldn't change at all. Um, so, You'll notice that now we rotated twice as much, and that's because each of these is sort of responsible for a 90 degree rotation. Um, if you remember on the last slide, we got a 90 degree rotation with a single sided transformation, but the Z turned out wrong. Um, here, each one does a 90 degree rotation, but the Z turns out right. Um, so. Basically, when you're doing these double-sided transformations, each side should only deal with half the rotation you want to do. So each side is sort of responsible for theta over 2. So do people feel OK about that? Yeah, I thought those were good examples. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. OK. Yeah, uh, I don't. maybe I should have put the abstract stuff after the actual examples, but... Yeah, anyway. So, um, yeah, as I was trying to say, each side does sort of half of a 90 degree rotation. Um, and we can kind of think of this as an operator R, and then this is the operator R dagger. And I think the sigma matrices are all Hermitian, so I'm showing here more concretely. Uh, you f the dagger makes you flip the order. So here we have y, x, and this is x, y. But then the sigma matrices are Hermitian. Um, and also, um, if we multiply sigma matrices in the opposite order, you can see that they actually cancel out. So like this goes to 1, and then the two y's will go to 1. So I think here I'm trying to show that uh, this um, is actually the inverse of this, uh, oops, when you switch the order. Um, so that this was a uh, 180 rotation in the XY plane. Um, if you wanted to do a 90 degree rotation, uh, what you actually have to do is each, each has to be responsible for 45 degrees or pi over four. And the way that you do that, um, is by, I guess essentially what I did is I did uh, cos of pi over 4 uh, of the identity plus sine of pi over 4 
for our XY rotation 90 degrees. So I'm kind of saying uh, half of it, this ends up being, these ends up being like uh, the square root of one over two. So I'm kind of saying like half of it should be the identity, just keep it as it is. But I also want half of a rotation in the XY plane. Um, that's sort of the best intuition I could give. So this, this represents a 45 degree rotation because um, it's like half the identity, half of a 90 degree. And then we do the 45 degree on the other side uh, by reversing the order of the sigmas. Um, does that, does that sit okay with you or is that, is that kind of weird? It seems harder for I was me more to, or less... to, to understand in that context, but I can believe you because I know about the future things. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So like, basically I think like the main point I want to get across is when you do a double sided, uh, transformation, each half does, does half of the rotation for you. Um, okay. So I think I explained this better here. So. Uh, when I, so before I was doing like easy angles, like 180 and 90, if we want theta, then this has to be a theta over two, half the rotation. And then this has to be another theta over two rotation. And they both combine together to give you a theta rotation. Is that, is that a little bit better seeing it like this and not in my messy handwriting? Yeah, so so like basically what you have here, uh, like basically like uh, I think it's called rotor. So basically it's like a rotation in yeah. x y plane. So those cosine and sine it's like a circle uh, parameterized in a plane. Yeah, so I think these correspond to. Um, yeah, they they cor they're rotors because they have like a a determinant of one each. So they correspond to a unit vector. Um, so I'm just trying to think here. Yeah, I, I sorry, I can't I can't put together what 3D vector these correspond to. But yeah, if you know what a rotor is, these are rotors. Um, but the the key thing I'm trying to show is that. You know, we started off completely forgetting about spinners, but we've sort of arrived at these half angles again. And we've sort of arrived at, uh, this is a member of SU2. And this is that same member, just uh, daggered, um, which switches the order of the X and Y. Um, so we started off at kind of a completely different place, but we still arrived at half angle matrices from SU2. Um, so does that feel okay for now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I only have like 10 minutes left before I need to leave. So I'm going to just finish this section. Um, so yeah, we can rotate a vector through the double sided action of a two by two complex half angle matrix, which is a member of SU2. And then each side does half the work of theta over two. And since it's a double-sided transformation, the total result is an angle theta. Um, so these are those same matrices we had before that we were applying to spinners. Um, you could kind of think of it as, I'm going to use this top one as an example. So cosine theta over 2, and then zeros here, plus... Um, how do I want to write this? I'm going to say sigma y, sigma z, uh, that zero, that zero, and then uh, I'll say sine theta two, and then sine uh, theta two. Um, so you'll notice that this is sort of like two matrices added together. Now, I think it turns out that I times sigma x that is actually uh 
I think this is either plus or minus i sigma x. I can't remember yeah, yeah, whether yeah. it's plus yeah. or minus. So you probably will have minus but, because you have minus in your formula here. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm honestly not sure. I, I, if I had to guess again, I think it might be zy, but I'm not super duper positive. But basic, any any time you have like two sigma matrices, you can always represent it as the third one times i. Uh, with a plus or a minus side, depending on the order. But you can kind of see how we started with these sigma matrices. Um, and then these members of SU2 are actually like the identity times cosine of a half angle plus um, some sort of like, I guess I'll just write like sigma i and sigma j. And then that's the sign of the half angle. And I think... All of these can be written that way. Uh, you'll notice this one is only on the diagonal, and that's because I think sigma z looks like this. And so if we get like uh, cosine of uh, plus i of uh, a half angle, oop, sine, sine of that half angle, uh, we get e to the i of that half angle. So that's why this one looks like exponentials instead of sines and cosines. We're just kind of combining them together. Um, so uh, the whole point of part two is I was trying to say when you have these two by two representations of vectors, like these ones that look like, you know, z, negative z, uh, x minus i, y, x plus i, y, which are just like a linear combination of the sigmas, when you rotate them, you end up rotating them with a double-sided action of an SU2 matrix, which can be built out of uh, the identity and the sigmas and like half angles. Okay, so, uh, so we kind of arrive at like similar transformations from two different points of view. Um, now the thing, Okay, and I think I go through an example here, I guess. I might skip over this, but we're applying this uh, here, and then it's dagger version, which just changes the minus signs. Um, and we end up getting uh, a rotation in the x, y plane. Like this just wrote, exchanges x and y. Oop. Whoa, what, 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 what just happened? Oh boy. Okay, well. Okay, but uh, hopefully you can believe that this just exchanges like the, the, the values of X and Y to do like a rotation. So that's, that's an example you can go through. Um, now to relate this back to spinners, um, this is sort of a weird trick, and I think it only works in three dimensions. Um, so basically, if you have a null vector, which means it squares to zero, um, now normally looking at this, you would think, well, the only way you can get zero is if you do zero squared plus zero squared plus zero squared. Uh, and that's true if you're working in real numbers, but if you're working in complex numbers, like if x, y, z are complex, you can come up with combinations that give you zero when you square it. Um, so remember that the determinant think, uh, of the... Just real quick, one thing that helped me uh, realize like what, what a good null vector is, is so like uh, light-like vectors uh, in, in Minkowski or in, in space-time. Yeah, um, and actually yeah. this almost makes a lot more sense in Minkowski space-time because because there's like a there's a negative sign in the norm, you can get, you don't have to go to the complex realm. You can actually just get it using real numbers. So uh, if you want to prefer, I think if you if you say time here, you, you can use the same argument. You just put a T plus Z and a T minus Z. Um, but uh, I'm just going to ignore that for now. But basically, uh, if it's a null vector, then the determinant will be zero. And if you know about determinants, it means when the determinant is zero, it means the two columns of V must be scalar multiples of each other. Um, so like if I have like two, four and like 200, 400, 
uh, that determinant will be zero because this is just a scalar multiple of that, just like times 100. Um, and of course, this means, like if I'm looking at this matrix, I could write this as two, four as a column times one, 100 as a row. So you can, if a two by two matrix has determinant zero, you can factor it out in terms of a column in a row. So it basically means you can turn your two by two null vector matrix into a column in a row product. Um, and I've, I've skipped the algebra, but you can end up solving for what these components are. And it turns out when you split this into two, into a column in a row, these end up being spinners. So why would I say that those, and again, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I'm like skipping over why this makes like where these formulas come from, but I'm just focusing on the idea. Um, so a spinner is sort of like the square root of this vector here because we, we can multiply two spinners together to get this, this vector. And what that means is when we rotate a vector, we apply this double-sided transformation, but we could also think of that as one side acting on this spinner and the other side acting on that spinner. Um, so basically, remember how I said these are members of SU2? A vector is gonna rotate by a double-sided action of SU2. So a vector needs a pair of SU2s to rotate, but a spinner, because it's the square root of a vector, uh, each one only requires one member of SU2. So there's only, there's only one SU2 here. So um, to kind of summarize, I started with this weird, you know, two by two representation of a vector. Then I showed you we can rotate it using SU2s, a pair of them. And then with this weird trick for null vectors specifically, we can break up a null vector into two, like a column in a row. And those column and rows only transform with a single sided action of X, SU2. Um, and that's exactly what we saw for like our, our states. It was a single sided action of a, of a SU2 matrix. So these sort of transform in the exact same way. Um, and I think I might have to call it there. I think I, yeah, I, I don't, I, this, I think one thing that you might be curious about is you can do the same thing for a space time vector. Uh, sigma T just ends up being the identity and you end up with like this. So it's almost the same thing just with like the T in the space where the identity was. Uh, the determinant is still the, uh, the, space-time norm um, and you can show you can show instead of being SU2 you end up with SL2C is what rotates these which is like the double cover of the Lorentz group so I don't have time to go through that but you could do the whole procedure again um, and instead of rotating a three-dimensional vector using SU2 you, ro you rotate a four-dimensional space-time vector using SL2C um, basically the the unitary the unitary uh, requirement goes away. You don't need that anymore. Okay, so I kind of have to leave pretty soon, but we can like pause and discuss. So like basically the main lesson is we got, we learned this like weird two by two uh, representation of a, of a vector. And we learned that we could rotate it like this where a belongs to su2 and then for null vectors um we can sort of turn it into like a spinner uh i don't know what, what do you call it is it like chi and phi i forget and each one will transform with a single copy of su2 instead of uh instead of a us uh, two copies. So uh, I did not get through nearly as much, and I think I botched up some parts of that presentation. But uh, that is that is the start of 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 spinners. So uh, do people have some questions? I'm sure you probably do. But uh, thoughts, questions. 
I think this was a great presentation. Yeah, it really elucidated some of the uh, some of the interesting mathematical aspects that I had not seen much before. Yeah, I wanted to get to Clifford algebras, but I didn't get to Clifford algebras. That was the part I thought was really cool. But yeah, I think that's not uh, a problem. Time. Yeah, I wanted also to say a huge thank you to you because it's kind of really a lot of. Uh, uh, a big amount of uh, very interesting material in there so i think we all will be glad to continue next week and to learn more yeah so do people want to continue this next week or do we want to do something else like i know there was that other member of the group who wanted to give a talk um so i'm perfectly happy to continue with this whenever whether it's next week or two weeks uh, so i'll leave it up to you what, what do you want to do uh, uh, Chris, is it possible to 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 give us the link to uh, to the recording, at so, least the private, or what would you do with this? Sorry, you you uh, you faded in and out there. I didn't quite get. Yeah, yeah. Button. There will be a, a recording, Marco. Don't worry. Yeah. Yeah, I I tried to record it using OBS. Um. I, so I, I uh, I've never done that before, but I'm hoping it worked. Yeah, I'm also recording it, it just to have some okay. guarantees that we will have that. So I, I think we will have one of those at last. Okay, we'll have at least a recording then. So, yeah. Okay, good. Because there's there was uh, so much uh, new material for me, so that I need to really go through a couple of times of this uh, material to ask anything interesting yeah yeah i have i guess it makes sorry go ahead yeah i just wanted to say that i have sent to beta chat uh my mind map for the first two sections which i wrote down yesterday i think so you can take a look and also i sent uh, the identification between c2 and r3 spaces and poly matrices as the direction in space so you can see the analogy there. Cool. I, I was going to make a joke that it makes sense that I got through half as much material on a talk on spinners because spinners rotate with a half angle. <laughs> That's a nice I joke. Know I'm, I'm, I'm pretty. I'm pretty funny, but. Uh... Yeah. So we'll just have to do the right half. The right half transformation next week. Yeah. So, um, hold on. Uh, so I guess next week, assuming we're going at the same pace, um, I was going to talk about these things called Clifford algebras, which they're kind of the thing that the Dirac matrices live in. Um, so like, uh, the main point of that is the Sigma matrices, instead of thinking of them as matrices you just think of them as like their own symbols so like kind of like how you you don't think you could think of the square root of negative one as a matrix like this but usually we don't do that we just think of it as like i and i just squares to negative one that's just the rule and you could have you could think of sigma matrices as matrices but you could also just think of them as like symbols that square to one and anti-commute so that's kind of the starting place for a sigma algebra and or uh, pardon me a clifford algebra and i think eventually i show um at the very end somewhere in here i show that your up and down states can be written i think it's this slide yeah so the up and down states can be written in terms of uh clifford algebra elements so that's going to take another two hours to get through i guess but um, anyway, I think I really need to hop off, but if you have any questions, you can type it into Discord and I can uh, answer later. Yeah. Thanks for putting this together. Bye. Yeah, no problem. Okay. All right, take care. Bye. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, we wish you no, uh, how to say, like, like easy, easy vaccination, no side effects. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, statistically, it'll probably be fine, but thanks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, That's I'm going to pop off. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, see you. See you. Ah. Chris. Yeah. Thank you. If uh, you want to discuss more, we can stay and, for example, talk with me also, so we, we can kind of wrap up.
Yes, yeah, sure. Probably I can also show you something. Uh, maybe, let me see, let me see what we have here. Yeah, so if you take a look at the beta chat uh, and for example, for the first picture I have sent to you. So on the first picture there, you can see the uh, Hermitian traceless matrix, which describes 3D vector using like C2 representation, basically. And using that thing, uh, we can think about poly matrices as the directions in space. And that's kind of the argument which that picture makes. So the first pictures are just says that we can reinterpret the Hermitian matrices and poly matrices as vectors in real physical space. Does it make sense? Uh, are you crafting this to uh, to uh, uh, at the same time? Could you repeat because you were cutting off a bit? Uh, okay, okay. Sorry, my mic is a little bit bad now. So I was just thinking, what was uh, really a distinct uh, between this? Uh, or thing and then then the state piece. Sorry, some uh, some cuts in your voice. So please repeat again. <laughs> okay. Or type. Maybe you should type in the chat so I can read. I think I got most of it. He said, "What is the distinction between something and the state space?" So was it physical and the state space? Uh, yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so uh, like physical space is like 3D space. We have like non-relativistic space and that's kind of it. <laughs> so, and we have like SO3 rotation in it, right? And that's it. Uh, but spinor state space or C2, uh, it's not like a physical but spinor state and you will have like four dimensions in there instead of three so you'll have four real dimensions so that's kind of it that's the difference and if you want you can kind of mm, encode the 3d vectors using the uh, c2 matrices so instead of using one spinner, so it's like not, not, not the one rank spinner, it's two rank spinner. So actually what Chris was using in the second part of the um, presentation uh, was rank two spine, uh, sp spinner. So, and you can see that on my um, mind map. So you can see the poly matrices as vectors item in there on the second picture uh, and there is an arrow going to the right, which equals those to the rank two spinners. So actually he, he was talking, maybe not knowing that he was talking about those, but he was talking about rank two spinners. And basically the, transform the, the, the transformations you will get for those will be of the same nature. So uh, basically we were talking about the connection between uh, about the connection between the physical space and the spinner spaces. And the connection lies in the double cover nature of SU2 and SO3. So there are a lot of different groups, uh, as we will see later. For example, in space time, we will have like SL2C group and it will double cover some s something else, right? Uh, like, uh, I, I don't remember the, the exact... Uh, undercover group there but anyway like basically we were talking about uh, like in simple terms we were talking about 
four dimensional sphere, like in four dimensions and three dimensional sphere, and that they are related by the table cover transformation. And that's that that fact lies in the core of the today's discussion, actually. Uh, and uh, need these uh, extra dimensions and different states. Is it uh, was it uh, a standard model? So we need to use of uh, mathematics to model uh, all the all the uh, particles, fundamental particles, and their fields and forces. So, as far as I understood, because you cut it for me once again a bit, but you are asking about like why do we need more dimension, right? Like four here. Uh, yes, this uh, whole concept of uh, 720 degrees. Mm. Like, I think basic, basic idea here is that there is more to the uh, physical space rotations than we usually uh, kind of intuitively know. So usually people think about 3D rotations as just a sphere or something and they only think about the axis but not the rotation itself and if you include the rotation itself uh, uh, then you will have that flag pole analogy the vector with a small flag attached and that's exactly what will uh, uh, kind of depict the SO3 group the rotations in physical space and actually you can transform that into a picture uh, which I call ball with a teleport uh, on the second picture. And ball with a teleport basically is real 3D ball and every point of it will describe a SO3 element. Um, so if you take the point in a ball, it will fix the vector going from the uh, or origin of the space from the like zero point, right? So you'll have an axis for the rotation and the length of that vector, so ball will have a radius equals to pi. Uh, and by adjusting the radius of the ball, we, we will have the length uh, parametrizing the amount of the rotation. So the length of the vector will give us the, like how much the flag is rotated basically. Uh, but we will have interesting property and that property is that uh, we will be able to teleport uh, from uh, the diametrically positioned points on that ball because they will represent the same uh, rotation. So rotation uh, like over the uh, vertical axis uh, over the pi is the same as the rotation over the uh, downward axis over like minus pi. So basically you will have the same rotations and therefore you can kind of teleport from North Pole to South Pole on that ball. So you will have also this picture added here. And uh, like pr probably the simplest thing, uh, so like fr from topological perspective, you will have two homotopy, homotopy uh, classes in there. So basically uh, continuous rotations pass uh, in that manifold. And that's exactly the reason why we have two classes for the belt trick. Remember or recall uh, chapter 11 where we, we had the belt and uh, you can recall that we had two classes in there, two class of passes. And you can use that ball with the teleportation to show exactly that we will have the two classes. Uh, basically, one will connect, uh, like will go all, uh, like will go through the ball from one pole to the other one, and the next class will go twice, like twice a time uh, from one, uh, like south pole and to the north pole. 
you you can kind of take a look at the Wikipedia. Uh, I think it is on the SO3 page in there. But anyway, uh, like um, the idea here is that to appreciate that manifold and to appreciate SO3 rotations, rotations in the physical space, you will be forced to go to the fourth dimension. So you, you are forced to go to SU2, to quaternions, and to get the nice properties where you will have nice uh, uh, kind of continuous uh, evolution of the rotation dynamics. So you will have a simply connected manifold basically in four dimensions and that gives like uh, more um, uh, how, how to say that like a uh, smoother way to do the 3d rotations or something uh, so one can think uh, it's kind of uh, having a rot uh, rotating things. Is this a kind of, kind of a insight we can we can get it? Yeah. So uh, you can also recall Hamilton, right? And Hamilton was trying to find like everyone at his time uh, knew that uh, complex numbers are responsible for two-dimensional rotations. So you have um, kind of uh, uh, SO2 and U1 isomorphism. So like rotation in the plane will correspond to the some unit complex number and you can rotate with those. And Hamilton was uh, driven by the idea that he wanted to uh, find the generalization of complex numbers, which will give the same effect in 3D. So he wanted to find the numbers which will uh, help him to rotate everything in 3D the same way the complex numbers worked in 2D. But he wasn't able to do that in 3D, recall that. And the revelation came on him when he added fourth dimension in there. And that was the key. So he got to SU2 actually, to three-dimensional sphere. And uh, that's kind of the whole story there. <laughs> oh, no, that, that's that's great story. <laughs> I can yeah, but you, you think, uh, even uh, even even further with this, like not only uh, rotating the flag in a, in a rotation, uh, but all, also this whole uh, um, could be rotating an object or something like that. There's basically no limits. On on, uh, on on this, how far you can go, and how many uh, rotations you have inside, or rotating things. But uh, pro probably for us, is this a really uh, this is the, the required is, is only this uh, spinners to to explain the yeah. uh, standard model you, interactions. If you want to see. A spinner in a real physical space, you just need to rotate your hand the same way Eric does it on the podcast. So you need something to be attached to, to something else in this space. And with that attachment, like a bell fixed uh, or hand fixed to your shoulder, after full two pi rotation, you will have a sign picked up by your hand. So you will have your hand with minus one side sign basically after two pi rotation and to come back you will need to do one more uh, two pi rotation and that kind of proves you it shows you that if you uh, have something connected to some kind of fixation point in a space you you will get that spinorial nature for the object in a physical space and I think that it kind of intuitively transfers to the uh, particles. So uh, that's my theory. I, I, I'm kind of, that, that's only the way I'm thinking about that, that electrons are actually connected somehow to everything else. And 
they have spinorial nature because of this. So you, you can reconsider it uh, as the animation you maybe have seen, like the cube, which is rotating with the belts attached to every, uh, how to say, like side area of it, or, or to, to, the, to the sides, basically. Yeah, Joss and the Balinese cup trick. Yeah, that, that's kind of it. That's a spinorial thing, which you can see. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, I've been uh, practicing this. It's a nice trick. Yeah, also I wanted to say that actually uh, there is also interesting um, square, which I indicated on my mind map, it's, it is situated nearby the two main themes uh, on the paper. So the first theme we were discussing today is block sphere. And another one was like poly matrices as vectors, I called them this way. And between those, you can see that I have written that we can convert spinner to the vector. And uh, to convert it, we need to have that uh, bilinear product. So basically we, we make in a sandwich where at the middle of it we have a vector consisting of the Pauli matrices and we have uh, a sandwich with a spinner uh, on the left and on the right of it. So if you take, uh, take it and multiply everything you will convert from the C2, uh, I mean from the complex plane to the RR3 space. And that's the way how you can convert from a spinner representation to the physical uh, representation. And actually that bilinearity uh, tells you uh, that like why, why we will have two to one mapping because minus S and S will be as good for that equation because of bilinearity you will have minus uh, multiplied by minus equals plus. So basically you will have two spinors S and minus S representing the same vector in the physical space. And that's kind of it. That's why uh, the spinner is the square root of uh, the vector, any vector. It shouldn't be a new vector actually. And you can read more about this uh, in the Steam paper, uh, which Chris mentioned. So those flag pictures was from that article uh, called Introduction to Spinners, uh, written by Steen, I think. Yeah, by Nate, I think he is disconnected already. So this, I think that's kind of it. That's all I wanted to say for you today.